If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. By popular demand, we're using our weekend shows to broadcast some of our most liked and commented on interviews from last year. The ones chosen have had excellent feedback from our listeners. If you've already heard this interview, I'm sure it will bring back memories of the education you appreciated. And if you haven't listened to this episode before, then please enjoy. Today, we're going to introduce an absolute legend, Monty Roberts. Monty has achieved so much, done so much, changed the horse world so much within his lifetime. His relationship with Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, who calls him the most influential world leader that's ever lived for improving the lives of horses. And we all know how much Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II loves her horses. Monty has been named as Horse and Hounds Magazine's Top 50 All-Time Greatest Horseman. He's also been a trainer to demonstrate his skills at the Spanish Riding School in Vienna, which is a little bit out of the box because they usually train within. He's been an outsider there. He's also created the world-renowned and revolutionary equine training technique called Join Up. So a lot of people have heard of Join Up. It was Monty who researched who watched horses, who worked out the instinct, the natural instinct of the horses to do that equine training technique. He travels the world. I'm sure that I don't know how many countries he's been to, but he demonstrates nonviolent, gentle training and creates breakthrough performance. He grew up himself working on a horse farm. He was a first-hand witness to the then traditional often violent methods of horse training. And when we talk about breaking in, we talk about breaking the spirit with an abusive hand. And that's what Monty witnessed and then rejected it. So once he rejected it, he's gone on to win world championships in the show ring. He's been named FEI Man of the Year in 1997. And now Monty's goal is to share his message that violence is never the answer. And he wants to talk a little bit today about Equus and his online university, and I'd like to introduce now Monty Roberts. Hello, Monty. Hi. Monty. I'm here. (laughs) Thank you so much for coming on today. I'm sure the horse world will um, enjoy this interaction that we're having with you and will learn from that. Now, Monty, your favourite quote is, my life's goal is to leave the world in a better place than I found it for horses and for people too. Can you speak a little bit about that? Well, yes, sure I can. I do have a life's goal, and my life's goal was created way back in the 40s, 1940s. It emanated from watching horses being broken, watching the unbelievable violence that we used for 6,000 years to train horses. And I would often hear, yeah, well, it has to be done that way, or hurt them or they'll hurt you, or it's suicide not to use violence. You got to break them Mm. and things like that. And I never believed, I knew there was another way sitting out there somewhere. The horses were were screaming about it. They don't want violence in their lives. They're a flight animal. Mm -hmm. They've never stalked, killed, or devoured another animal to to exist. Mm -hmm. And I just believed firmly because of the violence that was thrust upon me personally, that there has to be a better way. There has to be an answer to this thing. And I had a wonderful primary school teacher who agreed with me. She didn't know a horse from a cow, but she agreed with the principles that I discussed. Now, at the same time as a preteen, I was planning to kill my father. who broke 72 bones in my body before I was the age of puberty. And that means those were broken before 1946 or 1947. And I was born in 35. The first broken bones I suffered was at the age of four. And that will drive you to generally be violent. Mm. 
you will generally do what you disliked most about your parents. Mm -hmm. That's a fact of life in psychology, that we don't fall far from the tree, this acorn. And I had a teacher who told me, you know, you ought to kill your father. He needs to die. Oh, wow. He's a horrible man. I know what he's doing to you. I see the scars. But I love you, Monty Roberts. And I don't want you to do it because you will never reach your goals in life if you're known as the man who killed his father. And furthermore, if you detest violence so much against you, just know that if you kill him, you'll be using the same concept on him that he's using on you. And that stopped me in my tracks. Mm. And then she encouraged me to keep looking for that other way. Mm -hmm. And in 1942, I did my first join up. And I made the mistake of showing my father with a second horse what it was, and he beat the hell out of me for it. It was about 1946 when I did my first meaningful join up with a Mustang that they then sent to the butcher. Mm. So I call him the no name Mustang. But he promised me with his actions, that there was a better way. And then I just kept working on it. I hid it. I hid it from the time I was about 14 years old because I got so much grief from other competitors and other people in the horse industry about this namby-pamby way of doing things. My father would say, you're more woman than you are man, and horrible things like that. So I hid it away. And it wasn't until 1986 when I first showed it to anybody outside of my organization. And I'd already won several world championships, and I've won 11 now in total. And when I showed it outside of my organization, I paid a huge price. I had 180 horses in training at a good fee. On the year that I showed my first open house here on the farm where I am right now, and the next year, I had 20 in training, down from 180. Oh, wow. And that's because you did join up, because you, you allowed people to see the methods you were using? Well, you know, you can always ask, why did the horse do that? Because, I don't know the because, but I think I know that it was so far from normal that they didn't understand it, and it frightened them. They didn't know what to do about it. These trainers told their owners to take the horses away. They don't know what the hell this is. It's some voo-voo thing. And, of course, winning world championships is not voo-voo, but it took a long time for the world to begin to accept it, and still there's critics, a lot of them right there in Australia. And Australia was running parallel with me with some of the early trainers there in your country, who moved away from violence. That was with, with Kel, Kel Jeffrey, was that? Yeah, Jeffrey yeah. was one. And, you know, I think that we become something other than what we are when we've gone so far the wrong way that we can finally see it. And mm. Australia was very violent. I had some terrible times down there with people on the race courses I uh, had one fellow that was in a very prominent position step up to me with his finger in my chest and say, I'll tell you that Australia is the land of whips and dogs and you better get it in your mind. And if you don't, you know, I'm going to start using these whips on you. And uh, he was a guy in his 70s, but he was a tough guy, you know, and he wasn't talking to anybody that would have his feelings hurt that way. I'd heard it all my life. Mm, so mm. I didn't care that much, but he lost his job shortly after that. And, uh, and here in the Western part of the United States, we were running parallel with the use of violence in Nevada and California and Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, tough guys, you know, and you whip them with every jump. And then, you know, you go up there and you ride a 12-year-old and you might ride him all morning and he bucks you off at lunchtime. And they just didn't realize that whipping on horses causes them to lay and wait for you and catch you when you're not thinking about it and, and really charge you a price for it. So I think now, I mean, I'm really seeing the world change 
It is changing dramatically. I just had on this farm today a man from Hong Kong that wants me to come and talk to the Carbine Club. It's Australian as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're coming now from all over the world. He wants to get me in a helicopter and take me on mainland China where the people are waiting there to discover some of these things. And it's very gratifying. South America now leads the list of places that need to change. But, you know, you don't want to blame the people. They're doing what their parents did. They're doing what their uncle, their aunt, and their grandfather did. And you don't blame them. You just try to demonstrate for them a better way. And some of them will pick it up. And that's how I'm changing the world. Okay. I think it's a great mission. And I'm sure that the horse world, and in particular, the horses, will appreciate everything that you're doing. Yep. All right. Monty, your very first memories, and I know that, you know, you were involved with horses since, well, before you were born, but tell me about your very first memories with horses. Um, Very first, I don't know if you remember the first time you rode, the first interaction, but tell me about some of those very first memories. Well, you know, my earliest memories are riding with my mother Mm -hmm. and seeing these two ears out in front of me going back and forth. And I suppose I was maybe less than two. And the first memories that I have that are memories of awareness and of thinking it through so that you log those memories into your DNA, that was when I was four and I was showing in my first competition. I remember it so clearly. And I remember what I was told to do and trying to do what I was told to do. And then hearing that my name was called out as the winner of a contest with kids up to, Pat told me that she's researched it. They were up to 15 years of age and I was four. Yep. And I didn't know that that was unusual. Of course I didn't. I was (laughs) four and what am I going to know? I went there and I won and I got a trophy Mm -hmm. and it was given to me by a movie star. And I have a picture of the trophy and me sitting on my first horse. And, uh, Mm -hmm. I remember what they asked me to do, and I remember doing it. I can't remember where I left my glasses or my fountain pen. And I <laughs> sometimes don't remember why I came in a specific room in the house. But, but I remember those things, and I remember the first house we lived in, and then the second house, and the third house, etc. So the mind is, a, is an incredible instrument, and mine isn't the best instrument you've ever dealt with. I'll promise you that. I was a good student in school, but I had to work at it. And I, I know when I'm sitting there and I realize that the guy sitting next to me is way smarter than I am. Mm. Uh, better awareness of horrible things like mathematics and scientific formulas and stuff like that. So I'm no genius. I just happen to be someone possessed with learning why horses do certain things and why people do certain things. So I took up behavioral sciences. Mm -hmm. And I got two doctorates in those areas. And it's it's been an an unbelievable existence for me. I'm the luckiest man in the world. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. Monty, you've won 11 world championships. During that time, it seems like you were already winning and then you became more aware of what the horses needed. You discovered the join-up and the relationship you can build with your horse. How did that change your way of training for world championships during that time? Well, the way it changed it was to just sit down with myself and look in the mirror and say, no more violence at all. No more even putting hard pressure on a horse. Yes, you can ask them to give you their best, but not so that it causes them physical discomfort. And with physical discomfort, in my opinion, you slow the horse down in his appreciation for what you're asking him to do. So whipping and racing, now there's a fallacy for you. Nowadays, with what they call a jugs gun, do you know what a jugs gun is? No, no, if you can explain that. Well, it's what the policeman might have that he points out the window at you and he can tell you exactly the speed you're going. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. Well, they have those things now and they're discovering after 50 years of my saying whipping horses in racing is counterproductive. 
they're finally discovering that they run slower when they're whipped. <laughs> it's true they might run faster the first few times they're whipped because mm. they're frightened and they just panic. Mm. But that's never performance. And then they restart to resist it and they go into that pressure to try to fight it off. You take their mind off of it. Think about it. If you were a foot star and you were on the Australian Olympic team as a foot runner for a uh, hundred yards or for a mile. Mm. And think about it. You, you just coming up on the finish line, you got 50 meters left to run and somebody really smacks you across the backside. Mm. Is it going to make you run faster or are you going to brace against it? Are you going to roll your eyes back and think about it? Well, that's exactly what a horse does. And I've been watching a lot of videos on racing lately. And when you whip a horse right-handed, his head immediately moves 6 to 12 inches off-center to that side. Mm -hmm. If you whip him right-handed, he moves his head off-center to the right. Mm -hmm. You whip him left-handed, he moves his head off-center to the left. Anytime the weight, and that's about 100 pounds hanging up there, 150 pounds, causing neck and head mm. to weigh that, that's off center. And that simply can't allow you to run as fast as if all the weight was in the center. And so I'm watching things happen like horses come around the last turn in your country on the right lead generally, mm -hmm. and they finish the race then on the straight. Mm. And if they don't change to the left lead, then they don't finish as well because they've just run the turn on the right lead. So if you're whipping them on the left side of their body, they're going to stay in that right lead. Well, here in the United States, we run round to the left, and most of the jockeys whip right-handed. And the horse has been on the left lead, and as you whip him right-handed toward the finish line, he stays in the left lead and runs on tired muscles instead of shifting to the fresh muscles. Mm -hmm. And people haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> Um, amazingly enough, there's a guy called Trevor Dinman from South Africa that's a leading race announcer here in, in the United States, and he has figured it out, and he sits there with watches and these funny new kinds of timers and stuff, and he's discovered a lot of things, and uh, they're all pretty simple And now that we have today's technology, you know. So I'm learning every day. I'm only 82 but I'll be the, the first one to tell you that God has allowed me two lifetimes now because he said that any horseman needs two lifetimes, one <laughs> to learn it and the other to give it to the next generation. <laughs> That's great. So I get to be, I get, I'm 82, I get to be 160 now. Oh, perfect, perfect. That will the, Certainly the horse world will benefit for you being 162. That's, that's wonderful. All right. Now tell me about, uh, I'm just thinking, and I know that, you spent time with the Mustangs and, you know, that was sort of how you discovered, well, had more awareness of horses, their interactions with each other. But I want you to think of an individual horse, or you can name a couple if you like, that has influenced your way of teaching and training. Oh, sure. Shy Boy okay, yep. has been seen by about 500 million people. He's been all over the airlines with his documentary, and he was the lead documentary fundraisers, two of them here in the United States for public television. And Shy Boy was adopted by the BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation, and adopted from the BLM or the Bureau of Land Management, the public arm of the American government that owns the Mustang. Mm -hmm. And the reason the BBC adopted him was that this cowboy idiot from California said that he could go into the wild and part a Mustang off of the family group and cause him to accept his first saddle and first rider in the wild with no fences. <laughs> and we put up 80,000 pounds thanks to a lady called Lorraine Hegacy of the BBC. She said, let's go for it. Asking me what my percentage was on success and I said, it's 80%. I can do it 80%. She said, that's good enough. Well, I didn't know whether I could do it. I had done it when I was 15. But then the cowboys told me that I was a liar, that the horse that I parted off was just a horse that somebody else had already broken and uh, turned back out. Mm. And I said, three days ago, he was as wild as a deer. Mm. Oh, you're a lion, mm. you know, mm. idiot. Mm. 
And my father beat me up for that. So I didn't know I could do it again. Mm -hmm. When I did it, I was, what would that have been? I was about 56 or seven with back surgeries from the beatings and all sorts of things going wrong with me at 57. Mm -hmm. But I did it. It was Shy Boy that did it for me and answered the questions. And they had film, they had cameras on me for three days. I, I rode for 24 hours before I got join up. Mm, mm. And then I got my join up, which they couldn't believe. That was good <laughs> enough right there. Mm. And then I got a halter on him a few hours later, about 12 hours later. Mm -hmm. And the following morning, I had the first saddle and first rider on him. Mm -hmm. And it changed a lot of people. Not everybody, but a lot of people. There were people right there on the local scene that said it was phony, that we did something in the middle of the night to him that caused him to get good all of a sudden and stuff like that. But there's a lot of people that will, will deny things. But Shy Boy really put the period on whether my concepts were sound or not. Yeah, I, I think um, people deny things that they don't understand, you know, and if they hadn't seen everything you've done, there's just that lack of understanding. It's just a bit of ignorance, really. And uh, if we replace that ignorance with education. Yeah, there's more than ignorance to it, though. If you stop and put yourself in their place for a minute, mm. for instance, my father would say, you know, if you if your way is right, let's just say your way is right, you little jerk. <laughs> let's just say it's right. It means everything I've ever done with horses in my entire life is wrong. And you're not going to tell me I've been wrong in everything I did. Mm -hmm. Well, pre-teen, you don't tell your father he's wrong and go up against him. So I just walk away. Also, I hear, you know, you jerk. You can say I'm wrong if you want, but you can't say my daddy was wrong. He was the greatest horseman that ever lived, and he taught me everything he knew. And you come around here saying he was wrong. Everything he did in his life was wrong if what you say is right. And yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I'm very sorry about that, but it's true. And I can say that to you now, but I couldn't say it through my whole growing up period because I think that striking a horse is just dead wrong. It's the worst piece of horsemanship on earth to strike a horse to cause pain. And now I know that for 6,000 years, that's how we broke horses. And you had to break them, break their will to fight you. Mm -hmm. or they didn't do what you wanted them to do. Well, we had never tried it another way. I'm sure you've had throughout your lifetime a lot of proud moments. I want you to just think of your proudest moment. <sighs> I am so lucky. So many things have happened. Just recently being invited, the first human being on earth to be invited into the Spanish riding school to show a different way of dealing with horses, what a proud moment that was. Mm -hmm. What a proud moment I had with each of the world championships that Johnny Tivio won, and me sitting up on him, looking down his neck, and just thinking, you know, people are going to shake my hand and they're going to tell me how great it is when all I am is a passenger, watching a fantastically talented horse do his thing. The pride that I felt when Lomitas in Germany was scheduled to be put to death. Mm -hmm. He was banned from racing worldwide. He was on what they call the red line. He couldn't be allowed on any recognized racetrack in the world. And 10 days after I met him, he raced and won and became horse of the year. That's a proud moment. Mm. And even the little one that grew up and they called him Prince of Darkness because he was so mean. And he wanted to kill people at the starting stalls because those rails that jutted in there got into his flanks and he wanted to kill everybody in sight and he taught me that if you get two pieces of carpet and sew them together and put it over my hips so i don't feel those rails mm. i can win races <laughs> and i was so proud of him winning his first race you have no idea everybody was putting me down for it that was the stupidest thing to lay a piece of carpet over and now there's about 500 horses racing with it each week mm around the world mm -hmm. those are proud moments i have proud moments in my own life where this lady i'm married to we went to grammar school together we've been married 61 years 
and we've had 47 foster children, each of which was declared a youth at risk. And uh, they're all over the world doing well. Mm. How proud does that make you feel? How proud have I been for these military people that come to my clinics and check off significantly imp improved in three days with total trauma, with post-traumatic stress. A lady right there in, I'm so proud of a lady right there in Australia, by the name of Rachel Kerrigan, who went to Afghanistan and unspeakable things were done to her in Afghanistan. And she came back to ask for help. And the people that are supposed to help said that she would have to turn her 10-year-old daughter into uh, foster care because she wouldn't want her to live with somebody that was compromised psychologically. And so she walked out of the office and she came to one of my demonstrations and I put her in the round pen with a horse. And she's now working with Prince Harry in the Invictus Games. And her 10-year-old daughter is now almost 20 and is successfully working with her with other returning troopers from the wars of the world. Uh, you're speaking to the luckiest man in the world. <laughs> and so every every day, I, I worked with a Mustang today that was scheduled to be put down. They were gonna shoot him in the field because they couldn't do anything with him. He was such a killer. And his name is Diego. And uh, Diego came to us because they just threw him on the truck. They ran him in a, in a catch pen with other horses and then just threw him on the truck and said, send him to Monty Roberts, let him kill him. You can't do anything with him. He's a, he's a psychopath. <laughs> and uh, he just came up to me today and I rubbed his ears and gave him a rub. He's going to be all right. Good. I think this week I'm going to get a rider on him. Good. You're talking to somebody that has his, has had his life blessed with these kind of things, moments of pride. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. All right. We're going to talk about slightly off topic, the changes in technology that you've seen through your life. You know, from did you um, did you have a phone at home when you were young? My great grandfather had a phone, one of the first that you cranked. You know, mm, mm. I, I, and, I don't know. I've seen I, them on the movies. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've still I've still got it. Uh huh. I've still got it, and I'm on a phone to you right now. I've never turned a computer on or off. I wouldn't know how to send you an email if my life depended on it. I have a one of these things that they call a cell phone now, mm -hmm, and you mm -hmm. don't have to have wires to it or anything. You just carry <laughs> it around in your pocket, and and mine flips open, mm -hmm. and I can make a call with it and take a call with it, and that's as far as I want to go. I don't want to learn about technology that goes on to where I don't understand it at all. So I'm not one to talk to about technology that much, but I revere what happens with it. Mm. Mm. And the things we can do now with my online university. I mean, imagine the number of people that I'm reaching now that my website, I, I forget what they call that, Facebook. It's, my Facebook has 450,000 people on it. Uh, it's amazing. Mm. Oh, well, I was just going to say that, yeah, about the technology changes that you would have seen and the leverage that technology you're using. And it doesn't matter that you don't use the technology yourself. You've got a great team that works for you. And I if you do. spend your I time, do. yeah, you spend your time doing everything with horses and have a great team, then you yeah. can put something together like your university. So, yeah. yeah, if you can tell us a little bit about that, because the whole, um, you know, we, we talk about how can you learn about horses online and there's a big practical component with horses. No one's going to disagree right. and say, um, you know, you can't do everything online. But just tell us a little bit more about the university and what you're doing there. Yeah, well, I feel privileged that my life has been hands-on and I'm able to actually work with the horses and get all this. But how much faster kids can learn today? Because seeing a videotape of me doing something or somebody else doing something is so helpful. It must send them to their next practical lesson with a much greater head start than I ever had as a child. Mm -hmm. And the time that I can produce 
top-notch people now has been reduced to just a whisper, just a, a breath compared to what it was when I had to do all the ditch digging of it all by hand. Mm. And uh, we have an online university, and I say there is no substitute for a live body helping you with those important things and keeping you safe. But to give you a hint of where you're going and to cause you to choose the things that you want to do, it's immeasurable the help that technology can be today. And one who is not technologically educated can be can attest to that more than somebody that is. Mm. Because these kids today, they just think it's normal for these <laughs> things to happen. Mm. And I find it wondrous, like like an Indian watching you strike a match or something, you know? Mm. Mm. So I I am such a proponent of technology, you have no idea. While in fact, as I say, I haven't turned a computer on or off, mm. but I'm a proponent for it. And I understand that you have a university online mm. and I know I have one mm -hmm. and I work hard to try to do a practical lesson every week to put up on that mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. university so that people have a chance to literally see what I'm talking about. And if we're gonna change the world, that's the way to do it. Mm. If I didn't have that technology, I never would have in a lifetime made the difference that I'm able to make now. Yep, yep. And and so the online, it's really complementing what people are able to do practically. What I find is that it's so much more flexible. You know, people have got busy lives. They've got family, they've got other commitments, they've got work commitments. But if they can get online and do some study and do some research and watch some videos and learn a little bit more at an hour that suits them, that's a lot better than having to organise their time around. A oh, so much, so much more can be done. And you know, these kids are not stupid. They, they're so smart. And there are clinicians out there mm -hmm. that are doing some things online mm -hmm. that are just off the charts, mm -hmm. terrible things. Mm -hmm. And you can't fool these kids anymore. You know, when you rope a horse by the hind leg and drag him across the pen while you have it tied to the saddle you're riding, those kids will say, what is he talking about? That's no way to do it. And the clinician will be telling you that's what you have to do and have somebody get on that horse while he's on the ground uh, because you've got a, a rope around his hind leg. These kids are not stupid. They know that that's just brute force mm. and isn't necessary at all mm -hmm. in working with horses mm. and, you know, hitting them with the whips and and there was a clinician on there pulling a horse over backwards and then telling you that'll teach him a lesson. He won't do that again. These kids are smarter than that today. Mm. They're going to know that that isn't a practical solution to the problem. Yep. Uh, yep. So I'm proud of what you're doing and what my daughter's doing with my online university. Mm -hmm. I just make the the videos. They put them up there. I don't know how to do it, but somebody has to do the work hands on in order yep. to get this ball rolling. And uh, I'll I'll take that position and let you guys that know the <laughs> technical aspects do that part of it. <laughs> All right. Monty, it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you. I just want to know what, what holds, what is in the future for you? What are you looking at, um, you know, near future, no, further down? No, You've already talked no. about the Carbine Club, about going <laughs> on. Yep. But you, you, <clears throat> you just talked to me and you said you were going to um, talk to this 82-year-old man. And you can't ask a man 82 what's in your future. I don't. You'll, you'll be I, here you for can, another 182 yeah. years, and, or <laughs> oh, another right. another I, till till 160 another, anyway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. right. So, so what I want for the future, I want to see as much in the future as I can see of changes made in the benefit of these wonderful animals that have been so helpful to us for 6,000 years since we began to domesticate them. I'm having so much fun and every day, do you know who my best friends are in all of this? I'm thinking the horses. Yeah, they are my best friends. Who are my second best friends in all of this? My critics. Ah, okay, okay, because they keep you on track. Oh man, they keep me, I don't sleep well. I think, what am I gonna do to show that guy? Yep. Yep. That I'm I'm right and he's wrong, yep. you know, 
and and you keep getting up every morning and you go and they will they will uncover some leaves that you should turn you know <laughs> and and you'll improve i'm not doing things exactly the same as i did even 10 years ago mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. let alone 40 and 50 yep so so there's always improvements we can make and your critics are the first one to bring them out to you generally they're wrong in their own opinion mm-hmm. that's okay but they're helpful if they keep you up and they keep you working, and they keep your interest, and give you a target to shoot for, you know, to improve your your work. So I love my critics. Mm-hmm. Some of them are unfair, mm-hmm. and they they unfairly criticize. But that's part of it, you know. You got to have those tough ones that uh, you're never going to change <laughs> them, but they're going to change you. Sure. And I I love that about it. And I've got some right there in Australia mm-hmm. that keep coming through with with incredible stories about me that are just so untrue mm. and measurements of my techniques that are so untrue. But they stir me to my bone and they keep me going. Mm. Who, who, who at 82, <laughs> do you know, still travels 130, 140,000 miles a year uh, to demonstrate the work they do? Hands-on, demonstrate the work they do with horses that could put your lights out anytime they wanted to but he's still out there at 82 in the round pen, putting on the first saddle and the first rider in the middle of the marble hall in Vienna, for instance. Mm. You know, it just doesn't happen. And so my plans are just to keep it going as long as I can, hoping that I can stay physically able to do these things as long as possible. I love every minute of it. All right. Oh, that's absolutely wonderful. And as I said, I've really enjoyed the time that I've spent with you. Now, if people want to contact you, they can contact you through your online university and we can put a link up to that in the show notes. And yeah. just just a lesson. Monty, MontyRoberts.com yeah. mm-hmm. and then, uh, you know, oh, everything's on there. there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One last lesson for people to take away so they've got something fresh in their memory as we say goodbye. What's one lesson for people to learn from you? That violence is never the answer. Mm-hmm. Violence is always for the violator and not for the victim. Okay. Wonderful. No one of us, no one of us was born with the right to say, you must or I'll hurt you mm-hmm. to any other creature, mm-hmm. animal mm-hmm. or human. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you very much, Monty. I'll say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Oh, wait. Before you go, if you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses, or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 